A recent study by Ipsos Reid and the Ontario Securities Commission found that over 40% of Canadian retirees who were surveyed indicated that they do not presently have a power of attorney for property. This is a staggering number. The power of attorney for property may be one of the most important documents that you will ever sign. It gives a person or persons the authority to handle your property on your behalf when you become unable to. In this video, I'm going to walk through what a power of attorney for property does, why the document is important, common issues that I see with powers of attorney and why they should be checked regularly, and finally, important factors for retirees to consider when drafting a power of attorney for property. And if we haven't met yet, my name is Mark Walhout and I created this channel to share ideas and concepts that I'm using to help people with retirement every day. If you wanna get more videos like these, consider subscribing to the channel and hit the bell icon so that you're alerted when new videos are posted. Before we get started, just a quick note of reminder that estate documents and powers of attorney should always be completed with a qualified estate attorney. And this video is for information purposes only. So we'll start with what a power of attorney document does. And it primarily gives authority to your attorney also known as your donee, to make decisions about your personal property while you are still alive, but you're unable to make those decisions for yourself. It's important to have the document in the event that you become incapacitated due to illness, due to injury, or due to cognitive decline. The document can sometimes be used in a limited capacity, so you can set up a limited power of attorney that's designed to span a specific time frame for a specific set of assets. So for example, if you're planning to take a six-month holiday, but you have a rental property, you may provide authority to a attorney or a donee to handle your rental property while you're away. Most often powers of attorney are very broad in nature and they're meant to be long lasting. So primarily for retirees, we see continuing powers of attorney that are meant to survive through a period of incapacity. Now we're gonna spend some time talking about why the power of attorney document is important. And I think a lot of the reason that people don't have these documents in place, even people who are approaching retirement, is that they falsely believe they don't need the document because their spouse can simply step into their shoes. And this assumption is incorrect. If your spouse needs to step into your shoes if you're incapacitated, if you don't have a power of attorney document, your spouse will need to petition the court in order to take control of your assets. Another reason that people assume they won't need a power of attorney document is if they own their assets jointly. So they may believe that because they own their home jointly with their spouse, that their spouse will be able to make decisions, sell the home, mortgage the property. But this also isn't the case. Uh, a matrimonial home cannot be sold or mortgaged in the province of Ontario without the joint owner having capacity and signing off on the transaction. If they wanted to do so, they would also need to petition the court. And court procedures can be very costly and can be very long lasting, and they can include a number of steps. So first, there would be an assessment of capacity for the individual whose capacity is in question. There would need to be a lawyer that's hired. Paperwork would need to be filed to the court. There would need to be a circulation of notice to interested parties. There would need to be a court hearing and there would be drafting of a court order. And that entire process, depending on the nature and complexity of the assets in question and the situation of the person whose capacity is being questioned, could take anywhere from weeks to a number of months. And this would also coincide with a period of time that would be very difficult for the person who's petitioning the court. So picture that you have a spouse who's incapacitated and you're now having to go through all this work with the court, with lawyers, with lawyer fees and waiting while you're trying to also deal with the emotional toll and the time uh, that it takes to, to help and support a spouse who's going through a period where they're going to need assistance. So it's not ideal to have to go through this process. It can become very expensive. Uh, also, the court may become somewhat restrictive in terms of the authority that they might grant to somebody who's petitioning the court. So the court may decide to only allow the spouse, if they're the one petitioning the court, to have authority over certain aspects of the person whose capacity is being questioned, their financial assets. It may not provide that other spouse with enough latitude and decision-making power to properly deal with the assets the way that they see fit. And the other thing that could happen too is that the court might end up approving somebody who petitions the court who the donee may not necessarily want or believe is up to the job of taking over as their power of attorney. So for all these reasons, it's really important to have an updated power of attorney for property so that your loved ones don't have to go through this long and difficult process of petitioning the court in the event that you become incapacitated. 
We'll spend some time talking about common issues that I see when I read through power of attorney documents for my clients. And this should underscore the reason why I believe that these power of attorney documents should be reviewed on a regular basis. So the first thing that I notice when I read through these documents is that they may be out of date for a number of people who hold them. Oftentimes they're set up and people who they've named attorneys or the donees may have moved out of the country. They may be deceased. So you need to make sure that the people who are named in the document, that they reflect your current wishes and that they reflect kind of the current situation that you find yourself in. Donees who are out of the country or who live out of province may encounter issues when trying to administer your property under the power of attorney document. So you're going to want to be mindful of people who don't live in the same province as you when setting up these documents. The second reason that documents sometimes need to be updated is that the document may no longer suit the need of the donor. And this may be a situation where the power of attorney document was set up many years ago when the wealth situation of the donor was much different. Maybe they had not accumulated many assets. Maybe since they set up those documents, they've set up a small business. Maybe they've acquired some more complicated assets. And so as wealth increases, as complexity increases, it may change the way that you would want to name your donees or your powers of attorney. The people who were suitable for administering that power of attorney many years ago may no longer be suitable today. The third situation that does crop up that might cause a power of attorney to need to be questioned or maybe need to be updated is that it may include clauses that are no longer appropriate for the donor. And the most common clause that I see in power of attorney documents that needs to be reviewed is what's called a springing clause. So a springing clause is a line in the document that indicates that the power of attorney only takes effect after a certain circumstance has come to pass. And most often it's going to be that a doctor needs to sign off that the individual or the donor has lost their capacity. In some cases it may require that there be two doctors that have to sign off to indicate that the donor has lost capacity before the donee or the attorney is able to take authority over the donor's assets and over their financial affairs. And this is meant as a protection mechanism so that a power of attorney is not utilized against the wishes of the donor. But for people who are advancing in age, if there comes a circumstance where a power of attorney needs to be invoked, having to go to a couple of doctors and have them independently assess capacity of the donor can be very troublesome. It can be very challenging. So when somebody who's approaching retirement or they're in retirement has a springing clause in their power of attorney, it's worth a review and a discussion to inquire as to whether that's still necessary or not. If the attorney that's been named in the POA document is a spouse or a trusted loved one, that individual may consider removing that springing clause just for convenience purposes. Another thing that commonly comes up when I'm reviewing these documents is that they may not be properly executed. So in the province of Ontario, in order for a POA to be valid, it needs to be witnessed at the time of signing by two witnesses. They need to be present at the signing ceremony. The witnesses cannot be your POA. They cannot be your spouse. They cannot be a guardian over your children. They cannot be a minor. So oftentimes when people will not do these documents professionally, maybe they've purchased a kit online or they're working off a template that they purchased at a local stationery store, they may not execute these documents properly. And then the other issue that I have run across is where people sign bank powers of attorney. So if you go into your local bank branch and you ask to provide a POA that gives authority to someone other than you to manage your accounts, the banks may require you to sign a bank POA. And this sometimes creates a situation where the person signing thinks that that covers them off as a power of attorney for all their assets. And this is incorrect because the power of attorney that's issued by a bank or that somebody's asked to sign at a bank would only cover the assets that are managed at that bank. The other thing that bank powers of attorney can do, which creates a lot of risk for people who are signing them, is that if they're drafted in a certain way, they may actually revoke an outside held power of attorney document. So you may end up signing a bank POA and it might end up messing up your pre-existing, enduring kind of general POA and you don't want that to happen. And now we'll close with some important factors for retirees to consider when drafting a power of attorney for property. And I think far and away, the most important decision that needs to be made with respect to the power of attorney is going to be around the people or the person that you name as your power of attorney. So first and foremost, they need to be somebody that you trust, that you believe is going to act in your best interest. Next, you're going to want to make sure that the person who you name is up to the task to make sure that they're capable. Because you can trust somebody, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be well suited to manage your affairs. And there's a lot of work that can go into being a power of attorney. And if you have a complicated financial situation, if you're going to have a situation that's going to be very time consuming for the power of attorney, you're going to want to make sure that you name somebody who is going to be 
be up to the task and capable. The next criteria is somebody who is local to you. If you have a power of attorney that lives out of the province, and especially if you have somebody who lives out of the country, they will encounter issues with administering your power of attorney. So you're going to want to make sure that you name somebody who is local to you that can execute that duty relatively easily. The next criteria is somebody who has accepted the role. And oftentimes when I review these documents and ask the person who provided them to me whether they have communicated this document to the person that they've named and whether that person knows where to locate the documents. There are situations where people will say, you know what, I I just assume that they would be okay with being named here and they don't know where these documents are. These are really important steps to take. Make sure that the person who you want to name has agreed to take on the role and that they know where to locate the documents in the event that they need to use them. The next criteria is make sure as much as you can that the person that you name can avoid conflicts of interest. So if you have business interests that need to be administered as part of your power of attorney document, your business partner may have a conflict of interest when it comes to dealing with your assets while also they're dealing with their own business interests. Next is consider a pair of attorneys. So you may decide that you don't want one individual to make that decision or that set of decisions on your behalf. You may want to name a secondary attorney that they need to make joint decisions uh, on your behalf. I think that this can be a good step if you have uh, a power of attorney named as one of your adult children but you have a second adult child that lives close to you, it may be worthwhile to name that second child so that they're making decisions jointly. But once you get beyond more than a couple of attorneys, it can become a little bit cumbersome for them to administer that power of attorney. So I think that having a single attorney makes sense. Having multiple attorneys can make sense as long as it doesn't get beyond two, maybe three at most, just to make sure that the administration of that document remains smooth. And if your situation is somewhat complicated, if you have a lot of complicated assets, if you have a, a large, amount of wealth that is sort of spread out among a whole bunch of different holdings, you may consider also naming a corporate power of attorney. So you can name a professional POA either through a bank trust company or a private trust company who can administer your power of attorney document professionally. You will pay additionally for the service, but if your situation is complex, it may avoid some complication and additional costs by having somebody who's not up to the task administering your power of attorney instead. As another alternative to this, if your situation is complex and if you're over the age of 65, there are certain trust frameworks that might work for you. So you can move your assets if you're over the age of 65 into something like an alter ego trust or a joint joint partner trust with your spouse. And this sort of acts as a combination of a living will and your estate documents. So you can put your assets into a alter ego trust or a joint partner partner trust. The trust would be governed by a trust deed. It would be managed professionally by trustees that you name. And then when you're no longer here, the assets in the trust would be distributed to your beneficiaries. The benefits of this approach is that all the work can be done upfront while you have capacity. It can be set and you don't have to worry later on when you lose capacity, whether the documents are actually going to hold up and be suitable for you while your trustees or while your attorneys are working through managing your affairs. But it does include an additional amount of cost and complexity upfront. So I think that that is suitable for certain situations, primarily for people watching this video. By and large, I think that having a solid up-to-date power of attorney for property that's reviewed regularly, keeping in mind some of the things that I discussed in today's video should be suitable. Another quick reminder before we close that this video is for informational purposes only and that estate documents, including powers of attorney, should always be drafted and reviewed with an estate lawyer who's qualified in the practice before making any decisions. Thanks for watching this video all the way to the end. If you have any questions or comments, leave them below. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. Make sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon so that you're alerted when new videos are posted. Thanks again, and I'll speak with you soon. Take care.